Good morning, everyone. It is so good to see you and welcome to anybody online who's signing in and um, ready to worship the Lord with us today. I'm so glad to have you all. I just got a few announcements and then we will kickstart things with a prayer and we'll start singing. Um, just a reminder, we are having a cookie hour today after service and a business meeting alongside with that. And so that's right after service. You're welcome to come down and enjoy that time. Just a reminder that Birthright's dinner it, that they're going to be having, it's kind of a fundraiser for them. They're, it's going to be on November 5th at 5 p.m. at the St. Patrick's Catholic Parish Hall. And they're having food available, um, and it's $20 for one person, or if you come as a couple, then it's $35. And just a reminder that the whole concept is to help them to raise money to, to continue doing the work that they're doing. Alongside that, on November 12th, the women will be having a, a baby shower for Birthright to help collect items that they are in need of. Um, Ashton will have a list of the needs next week, um, and you're, the, all the ladies are welcome to come, enjoy games, and, and um, br bring snacks, please, so that 
it's going to be kind of like a potluck. Bring, bring some snacks so that as you guys are playing games and enjoying that time, you can have something good to eat. And I wanted to just remind you all, because it's upcoming soon, and uh, it'll be November 7th is when I'm going to be starting a Bible study on the book of Revelation. That's going to be at 630 down here in the basement of the church, um, just so you're aware of when that's going to be starting on the 7th. It's the first Tuesday of the new month, and then we will continue after that. It will be every Tuesday, unless something comes up that we got to cancel, but every Tuesday at 6.30, it'll just continue to, to do that and until we go through it. And I, I'm, I'm going to warn you, as I was going through some of the stuff, we'll, we'll be going through it for a little while. And that's not a bad thing because we want to really come to understand what's going on. And so just if that's something you're interested with, in, everybody's welcome to come. And so that will be starting 6.30 on the 7th of November down in the basement. And we will probably have coffee and stuff like that. So I believe that's all unless I have missed something. Yes? Huh? Things for, things for apples? Apple sales? Okay, so if you're wanting apples, there's, there's some papers back there that you can fill them out, bring them to Natalie, and she will make sure that, that you're able to get those. Are you de guys delivering them too? Um, yeah, I think we can deliver some of them. Okay, so you might even be able to get them delivered to you. So if, if you're looking for some apples for canning or whatever, Natalie's got the information for you. All right, is there anything else? No? Okay. Will the praise team start making their way forward? Oh, you guys are already up here. Great. You guys are ahead of schedule. And will you please stand and we'll open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come to you today, Lord, with hearts full of gratitude for the fact that we get to come together as the body of Christ to worship and praise you in various different ways, Father. We love you. And we just ask, Lord, as we go through the service today, that our worship and praise will be pleasing to you, coming up to you. But we also ask, Lord, that your, your spirit will be here with us and that you will open our hearts, our minds, and our souls so that we can grow closer to you in some way in our relationship, in our knowledge of you, in our understanding of you, Father. And we ask that your spirit will help us to apply that into our life and live for you, Father. We love you, we praise you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Psalm, Psalm 143, 145.3. Great is the Lord, greater to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Great is the Lord, he is holy and just, by his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord, He is faithful and true, by His mercy He proves His love. Great is the Lord, and worthy of glory, great is the Lord, and worthy of praise. Great is the Lord, now lift up your voice, now lift up your voice.
Psalm 8 1. Lord, Lord our Lord, Lord, how majestic is your name in all, all the earth. earth. You, you have set your glory in the heavens. heavens. guitar right and did you know that there's something really interesting about guitars I'm gonna share with you here but before we do I got a question I got a question that you guys need to kind of think about do you guys know what choices are And how about, yeah, right there, what? Choices are things you do between what you would write and what you want. Yeah, that's, that's part of it. See, what you're kind of talking about there is this other word that's really important, free will. Did you know God blessed you and all of us with the concept of free will, which allows us to choose one way or the next, to choose many different things, right? See, a guitar's a good example that we can look at this because see I have the free will to play this guitar however I feel could I do this what's that doing is that playing the guitar you know I even have the free will that I could sit there and just go did that sound okay this sound like chaos see free will allows me to choose to play this guitar however I want. However, there's something really important that you need to understand. This guitar was designed to be played a certain way. It was designed for you, for it to be used with fingers going in the right spots to make the right notes. And as it's designed to be used, when it's used that way, it makes really interesting and beautiful sounds. See, that's how the guitar was designed to be made, right? And used. I mean, do you think that Jocelyn playing her violin, could you just go pick that up and play it and make it sound good? No, do, do you think that Dale playing his guitar, that you, that you could just pick up the guitar or like mine and just make it sound good? No, why? Because because in order to understand how to use things properly, you've you got to get some training, right? Some practice. Like playing the piano? Yeah, just like when you play the piano and when you play the, man, the mandolin, you guys have to learn ukulele. ukulele. Sorry, that's what my dad played the last time he was here. But see, 
the idea is there takes effort and things that go into this. I mean, you could just go through life doing that way. Or you could go through life living life the way you were designed. Now, this is important because did you know that you were designed by God to function in a certain way? And that's where this word free will that I brought up earlier comes into play. You see, he did give us free will, and he gave us the choice that we could choose to either follow him through his methods, his word, and doing things according to his ways, with, with him as Lord and Savior of our life, or we could choose chaos. You know, when we choose the wrong decisions and we start sinning. Chaos would be a good word to, to, to reference what sin does because when we start making the wrong choices, we go down the wrong paths, our life becomes very chaotic. It may seem enjoyable at times, but it leads to chaos and destruction. But using our free will that God gave us and choosing Jesus who had given his life for us, see, that allows us to truly be free with him functioning the way he designed us to. See, I got a couple Bible verses here that, that help us to understand this. One's from the Old Testament, one's from the New Testament. We'll read the, we'll read the New Testament first because I think it helps set the ground. It comes from Ephesians chapter 2, um, verse 10 specifically. It says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. See, this verse is really important because this verse helps us to understand that we were created with a certain purpose and, and a certain way to function. And it helps us to know that we were created to function with Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. See, the other verse I'd like to share, it comes from Psalms. And, and it comes from Psalms 119, and it's in verse 105. It's also another really important one that says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn and I will confirm it that I will keep your righteous ordinances. See, what this one says is you were designed by God to work in a certain way. And then what the second verse shows us is he has given us the manners in which to follow that right path. In which when we follow that path, which is here in the Bible, it gives us all of that information. This is the word of God. When we follow that and do the things Jesus calls us to do in, in this, then we are functioning like we were designed to function. See, that's an important thing. We do have free will. We can choose one way or the other. But Jesus is calling us to choose him so that we can function the way he wants us to function so that we can make beautiful music with our lives so that we can not only glorify him but so that we can glor or we can bless others through the love of Jesus Christ so that's really important remember you do have free will but Jesus is calling us to use that free will so that we could be used as he designed us to be all right kids you you can go to your class Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't even have. Oh, there we go. Second Timothy four seven through eight. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is a laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteousness Judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved us appearing.
staff today, so please bear with us as I transition back and forth. In John, Jesus is speaking to his disciples during the Last Supper, and in the first verse we read, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my, uh, This wasn't just an abstract theological teaching. There was reason in the hearts of the disciples and in Jesus that night for the troubles. Jesus certainly had reason. He knew that the next day he would be in a tomb. He also understood what he would have to endure before he could experience the relief of death. If we have any doubt that Jesus' heart was troubled, all we'd have to do is walk with him when he went to Gethsemane. But the disciples also had reason to be troubled. The Romans were everywhere. The Sadducees and the Pharisees wanted to kill Jesus, and here they were in the heart of Jerusalem. They also knew there was lots of danger around there, but the preparation for the Passover had been made in secret. That's unusual. But also, there had been all this talk of sorrow, of death, and the burial, and the resurrection. Jesus himself had changed the Passover where they would normally talk about the deliverance from Egypt, which was, was the tradition, he had talked about the bread of uh, being his body and the wine being his blood. Then he spoke of going away and leaving them. But where was he going? We often don't think about it, but the Lord's Supper began in a climate of fear. But looking back, the disciples would come to realize that as the other, at the other side of this fear was victory. So whatever troubles your heart today, 
Jesus gives the same answer himself. Jesus is the answer. He took upon himself all of our struggles, all of the uncertainty, all of the heartbreak that comes with being a human. He overcame them all, even to the point of death itself. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity to come together as a congregation to sing your praises, learn from your word, and to remember your sacrifice for us and to look forward to the blessed day when you call us home so that we can be with you at the wedding feast, smiling, laughing, pointing to you, and giving you the glory in all that we do. We thank you, Lord, for being willing to die for us, that we would have a right relationship with you, God the Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, just as a little bit of administrative stuff here first. I'm not Quentin. We have a lot of new people here today. My name's Andy. I have the privilege to fill in for Quentin today because, well, Quentin decided he had to have a day off. Actually, it's by contract. So <laughs> Quentin's got the day off. I have the pleasure of your company. So let's go ahead and pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Again, Lord, I thank you for this congregation, this group of believers willing to come together to sing your glories, praise you, learn from your word. Now, Lord, as I deliver this message today, I pray that you would uh, let us see Jesus and Jesus only. In Christ's holy and precious name, I pray. Amen. Now, for those that don't remember, I've spoke a couple of times, and uh, one was about wearing the full armor of God. The other was and what we had to do to be in shape to wear the full armor of God, just to come to this place and say, hey, I've got it on. If you're not in shape and willing to use it and wield it properly, it'd be useless. And I happened to show some pictures of what the armor of God would look like. So over here you have Quentin. There's Johnson Erroneous. He's the bald fellow over here. Remember, God knows every hair on your head for Andrew with a real short lesson. We have Delonius there, we have Temple Vedicus, Bellyman, and Baeticus. Now, I'm going to be completely honest with you. This has nothing to do with my message today, but I went to a lot of work. I liked it, and it makes me laugh, so that's why we started with this. Now, though, we are in shape. We're going to be wearing our armor of God, but most of us think that the devil is going to do what to attack us. I'm going to take a look at the devil's battle plans and his individual attacks today, okay? So if I was the devil and I wanted to attack you, what would I use? Don't go there, Dave. I'll use you as a sermon illustration. <laughs> you would probably use the standard temptations. You've got your drugs. You've got your alcohol. You've got sex, money, power, and all that does affect each and every one of us. However, if I wanted to affect a whole lot of people all at one time, 
what would I do? Well, that's easy. We've got fear. Fear. An example was COVID. Everybody lived in fear because of COVID. And what did we do? We shut down the world economy, we shut down our schools, we shut down the businesses, and more importantly, we shut down our churches. And everybody was okay with that. There was a few dissenting voices, but not many, because we were living in fear. What other fears do we have today? Well, our national debt is $33 trillion, growing rapidly. We have our economy is, our economy is questionable. We have recessions. People are even mentioned the dirty word of depression. The border is wide open. There's war between Russia and Ukraine, Israel, Hamas. They're saying that terrorist strikes could happen in America and all throughout Europe if they go into Gaza, Israel goes into Gaza. Possible war with China, Taiwan, Antifa, BLM, wokeism. The list goes on and on and on. Fear. And the neat thing about fear, it's kind of like the old game, whack-a-mole. Oh, I muted the computer. I'm sorry, there's sounds that goes with this, but that's okay. Everybody remember whack-a-mole? And I should have left that up, but just like the little player in that game, though, trying to hit the mole on top of the head, that's how we are with fighting fear. We're always that much too late, and fear is going to take a hold of us somehow. But those are all national problems. Everybody throughout the world are facing these. What about your personal fears, love those. Fearful of being replaced at work, fearful of, having a, uh, of not having a job, fearful of being rejected by the people you want to accept you, fear of not getting married, fear of not having children, fearful of public speaking, been there, done that. Fearful of witnessing to others, been there, done that. How about fearful of praying in public? Oh yeah, been there, done that. Fear is a powerful tool of our enemy. And the, mo the moment fear enters the sphere of your communication, the sphere of your thought life, the sphere of your making decisions, I can guarantee you that it did not come from God. Fear does not come from God. And how do you know this? In sec sorry, it was already up there. 2 Timothy 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love, and of a sound mind. Let's break that down real quick. Power of, power of what? Power to overcome fear. The love for what? To love those that live in fear. And finally, a sound mind. When you live in fear, you'll make illogical, irrational, unscriptural, ungodly decisions. Fear does not come from God. When you allow your fear to govern your life, you're operating in a realm that God never intended you for you to operate in. It did not come from God. However, there is one thing we are told to fear. Anybody? God himself. Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Continuing on. Proverbs 16.6. 6, Through love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for. Through the fear of the Lord, a man avoids evil. My favorite, Isaiah 8, 11 through 14. The Lord spoke to me with his strong hand upon me, warned me not to follow the way of this people. He said, do not call conspiracy everything these people call conspiracy. And do not fear what they fear. And do not dread it. By the way, that's where everybody's at right now. Where everything that the media screams, conspiracy, 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 is what he's talking about here. Continuing on verse 13, the Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. And he will be your sanctuary. And just so you know, it's in the New Testament also. 1028, Matthew. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So there's only one thing we should fear, and that is God. But that doesn't mean the devil, our good friend again, is going to give up trying. The devil is going to keep talking to you, talking to you, and talking to you. He literally can never shut his mouth. Even when we ask him to, he keeps talking. He's going to use different voices, different circumstances, but it's all the same game. He uses the same modus operandi, fear. 
because it's worked for thousands and thousands of years. It's kind of like these magnets I have up here. Now, let's just call this a fear. I'm going to say it's fear that Candy is going to be mad at me today, which is likely. If I take another magnet, maybe I'm going to say I'm going to get stuck going back home to Lone Rock. And if I align the poles correctly, north to south, we know from our basic science it's going to join together. Sure enough. And then let's have another fear. Well, I'm really worried what's happening in the world today, so we'll put that on there. Here's another fear. I'm going to get a flat tire on the way home. Here's another fear. Alita's going to have work for me to work on tractors. And that's a reality. Yeah, thank you. Oh, she's got two tractors. Thank you. The point is, you keep adding these fear up, and eventually, you're going to have a severe weight about your head and shoulders. And what's the problem with that? Well, at some point, after you've developed this big collection of fears, you're going to get to the point you can either become paralyzed, unable to do anything, or the other extreme, which the devil really enjoys, you become apathetic, where you honestly say to yourself, there's nothing I can do to change anything, therefore, I'm not going to participate anymore. But God, in his infinite wisdom, he gets involved when you accept him. Again, instead of north to south, he turns it around. Now you have north to north. And as we all remember as kids, trying to push those things together, well, dang it. Jacob, you're stronger than I am. No, I'm kidding. The whole point is you can't hold it there no matter what you do. And even if you do for a little while, eventually it's going to fly apart. God gets involved and he destroys all that. Go ahead. You can say, what a nice example, huh? No, oh, no, no, don't do that. Don't whatever you do. So let's look then at how we're going to overcome fear. I want to use the uh, example of Jehoshaphat. He was a good king in Israel, and there weren't that many. He uh, became uh, the king when he was 35 years old, and he reigned for 25 years. Now, for those that are keeping track today, I've already talked a while, there are three main points. That's all. However, I'm also going to give you three pre-points at no extra cost. You're welcome. We're going to start in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses... Oh, shoot. I'm going to go back. When you live in apathy, this is a great quote. When Satan gets you to the point of apathy where you don't want to do anything, then you say, the only things necessary for triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And that is why Satan loves apathy. Good men doing nothing. Now we can go on to 2 Chronicles 20, verses 1 through 4. Now it came about after this that the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon, together with some of the, uh, some of the I think it's pronounced Moonites, came to make war against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and reported to Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the seas, out of Aram, and behold, they are in Hazazan Tamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat was afraid and turned his attention to seek the Lord, and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. Now, again, pretty obvious, but we're going to review the big picture. Here's Jehoshaphat. He's sitting in Judah in Jerusalem proper. Someone comes in and say, a bunch of people are coming to attack you. And immediately he becomes afraid. So what's he do? The first point, he set himself to seek the Lord. If your Bibles are open, stick a pin in, on it, pin in it, underline it. Seek the Lord, pre-point number one. Instead of just listening to his fears, he sought God. We literally must do the same thing. If you start to fear something, you say, God, help me. To determine what God's will is in your life. Pre-point number two is highlighted up there a fast throughout all Judah. He sought the Lord, and he called a fast. Now, I am not talking about the kind of fast where you miss one or two little meals. I'm not talking the type of fast that the Sadducees and the Pharisees used to do, where they'd stand at the street corner, let their hair go bedraggled, let their face go gaunt, and they'd say, look at me, I'm suffering, I'm fasting for the Lord. I'm talking about a fast is Isaiah 58, 5 through 9, which reads, Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for a man to humble himself? It is, only, 
is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? It is not this kind of fasting I have chosen, to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear and your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, Hear I am. That's true fasting. I could spend many, many messages talking just about fasting and how we misunderstand what that word literally means. He sought the Lord. He called for fasting. So this was the whole nation of Judah now fasting together. But what's the second, th uh, third thing he did, the third pre-point, we find in 2 Chronicles 5 through 9. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And he said, O Lord, the God of our fathers, art thou not God in the heavens? And art thou not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in thy hand so that no one can stand against thee. Didst, didst excuse me, Thou not, O our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before the people of Israel and give it to the descendants of Abraham, thy friend forever. And they lived in it and have built it, uh, have built thee a sanctuary there for thy name, saying, Should evil come upon us, the sword or judgment or pestilence or famine, we will stand before this house and before thee, for thy name is in this house, and cry to thee in our distress, and thou Thou, thou will hear and deliver us. Point three then is obvious. He prayed. He sought the Lord, he fasted, and they prayed. Those are the three pre-points that we have, and that's what each and every one of us should do when we fear. When there are troubles we feel we cannot happen, handle, we approach the Lord. How many here know the power of prayer? How many here know that it does change the circumstances? Well, we have actually three great examples of this. Paul, Sam and Mary Kay's grandson. Remember he fell in the pool? He was deathly sick. We prayed. Churches prayed throughout the nation. He was healed. But then we have Dick Temple. Oh, my gosh. He was on death's bed door. My friends, prayer works. I did say three, and I'm going to go ahead and share it. I thought about it. I know this little old lady that prays mightily every time her handsome husband goes hunting. And she prays that every deer, every antelope, every elk, every bird will not be in front of me so I won't bring home an animal. And yes, her prayers work. The power of prayer is awesome. <laughs> prayer is powerful, even if it isn't answered the way you expect it. Remember that. You may pray for something, you may not get it. God is still there. The prayer is being answered, just not the way you thought. God responds to Jehoshaphat because they sought God, they humbled himself by fasting, and they prayed. And responds, and what did God tell him? Well, I'm glad you asked. Continue on to 2 Chronicles 20, verses 13 through 17. All the men of Judah, with their wives and children and little ones, stood before the Lord... Then in the midst of the assembly, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, the Levite of the sons of Asaph. And he said, listen, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not fear or be dismayed because the of this great multitude, for the battle is not, your, uh, not yours but God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the valley in front of the wilderness of Jeruel. You need not fight this battle. Station yourselves. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, 
Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out and face him, for the Lord is with you. So the first key point that we have today is verse 15 up there. For the battle is not yours, but God's. It's not yours, but God's. If we look at all these worldly events, we can't change a thing. And if we read in Ephesians 6, 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. I think we all can agree evil's running rampant right now. The whole world's on fire. The battle is not yours, it's God's. We must realize that there's some things in life we cannot fix. There are uh, things you can't change the circumstances of, situations that are beyond our resources, beyond our capacities, and beyond our abilities. But God says what? Do not fear. Do not fear. Do not be dismayed, for the Lord is with you. Understand and grasp it deep inside of our souls that what you are facing right now is not your battle but God's. Continuing on in Ephesians 1.6, being confident of this, that he who began a work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. Again, we were talking wordly, now I'm going individually. You have problems that you think you cannot handle? The Lord is not going to give up on you. It's not going to happen. He didn't bring you all this way to leave you to Satan's devices. He is working on your situation even now behind the scenes. You may not see it, but God is there. There will be no doubt in your mind that God made whatever it is you're praying for happen. It wasn't your bank that did it. It was not your boss. It was God. See, the problem we always have is we try to fix it ourselves. I'm terrible about this, and I know Dave is too. We put our greasy hands on it, get our fingers all over it. We try to improvise, adapt, and overcome. And what we really need to do is seek God, fast, pray. Seek God, fast, pray, and let God fix it because God's got your back. Okay, so we need to seek God, humble, and pray. Continuing on, though, for the next point, we find in 2 Chronicles 20, 18 through 20, and Jehoshaphat bowed his head and his face to, with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites, from the sons of the uh, Kohathites and the sons of the Korazites stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. And they rose early in the morning and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, O Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Put your trust in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Put your trust in his prophets, prophets and succeed. So what do you think the second key point is? Put your trust in God. Put your trust in God. Put your trust in God. It's really pretty simple at this point. Even though it looks like you're going to lose, even though we sh wouldn't stand a chance, if we had to do it ourselves, we have to put our trust and faith in God. Your prosperity, your victory, is literally tied to your ability to put your trust and faith in God. Do you really believe what you believe is true. Let me say that again. Do you really believe what you believe is true? Do you believe that God works by prayer? Do you access, access that? Do you really believe that God can change your life for the better? You have to access that and believe it. Grab a hold of it. Faith is what moves God, not your tears, not your anxiety, not your worries, none of it. If you want God to move, you must have faith. And we know in chapter 11 of Hebrews that without faith, it is impossible, impossible to please God. And then I know I'm looking back here and I say, but Andy, how can you be so confident that he is going to do this, that uh, he's going to work in my life? 
Well, I have a, a track record with God like each and every one of us, but I have a track record. I have a history with the man, and he has looked after me. He's made all the major decisions in my life. I can look back over time and see where he has worked and where he hasn't worked when I've tried to fix it in myself, the way he steered me. He's never, ever, ever abandoned me. The problem most of us have, again, is that we tend to focus on our immediate situation that's going on, forgetting what God has done for us in the past. A good friend of mine, I've never met him, Steve Brown is his name, he's the minister of Key Life Ministries in Florida. He set out these wonderful sermons that I've listened to my whole life. And one of his points is simply this. Whenever you bring a request, a prayer request to God, count 10 blessings first. Count 10 things that he's done for you over the last several weeks. Why? It'll put you in the correct frame of mind for your prayer requests that you can see that he has worked in your life. He is continuing to work in your life. He will work on this prayer request also. It's an attitude adjustment when you pray. He will not abandon you. Continuing on, coming to the last point, people. We're almost there. Hold on. Second Chronicles 20, 21 to 23. And when he had consulted with all the people, he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire as they went out before the army and said, Give thanks to the Lord, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And when they began singing... And praising. The Lord set ambushes against these sons of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so they were routed. For the sons of Ammon and Moab rose up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, destroying them completely. And when they had finished with the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. Rejoice in the Lord is the final point. Why? Well, again, it's an attitude adjustment, but it becomes more than just that. When we acknowledge God for what he's done for us, when we sing his praises, when we share in church the blessings we've received, we also encourage fellow believers in Christ. That's the reason we come to church. It's join strength from each other, support from each other, have people pray for us, but also to sing praises to the Lord and encourage each other. So we seek ourselves, we humble ourselves, we pray, and that we have to realize the battle's not ours, trust in the Lord, and rejoice in the Lord. Now, I'm coming to the very final point I want to make. Is everybody awake and looking at me? Because I think it's a great conclusion, and I, I really want everybody to enjoy this. All the problems the devil causes, whether it's fear, temptation, anxieties, it literally all boils down to one thing. Control. It's a control issue. And I'm not talking about Satan wanting to control us. I'm talking about our control issues. We have a problem. We do not want to relinquish control. In America, we're taught uh, to, uh, to succeed, to live the American dream, we need to do it ourselves. If there's a fight, you get into the fight. If you fail, you pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you go. To live the American dream, you have to do this. And now I know this is going to surprise most everybody in here, but I'm a man. Apparently, I have lots of control issues, and they all involve remote controls. I don't know where Candy comes up with this, but I have control issues. And I also spent 20 years in the military. Yeah, I've got serious control issues. Okay, don't cross me. It wouldn't be pretty. Andrew's tried it. Look what happened to him. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Remember the communion meditation. Our answer is Jesus. We know this. We need to pray. We need to seek, pray, fast and pray, and go from there. But these control issues, how do we deal with that? The final scripture we have for today is going to be found in Ezekiel 47, 3 through five. Before you read it, though, let me give you a little background. In Ezekiel, the last eight chapters, verses chapters 40 through 48, both the northern and southern kingdoms have been hauled off to exile in Babylon. And now Ezekiel is taking in visions to the new Jerusalem. And when he gets there, he finds an angelic being that is holding a, a line 
and a, a measuring rod. And they're used for measuring everything. And Ezekiel is told, report everything you see and hear back to the Israelites. Okay? And now we're going to pick up here in Ezekiel 47 through 5. As the man, the angelic being, went est angelic being, went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits. Just so you know, that's about a quarter mile. And then led me through the water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through the water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and he led me through the water that was up to my waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross. This is a perfect illustration of walking with God and our control issues. Let's take a look at it. When you first walk into the water up there, it's up to my ankles. Hey, that water feels really good. I can even feel a little bit of sand moving, but by golly, I'm still 90% in charge, in control. I'll listen to God when he wants to talk to me or when I want to hear. What about if I take another step out in that water? It's up to my knees now. Hey, I'm still in charge. Sand is really moving around my toes now. Feels good though, but I'm still three quarters in control. Take another step out there. Now I'm up to my waist. Now my feet are sinking in the sand as the water's moving over them. I'm starting to feel that current pretty hard, which is the will of God. But I'm still in control. It isn't till you take the full plunge, till you're in over your head, that God steers you and you are going to do things you never expected you would do. Next thing you know, Jacob's going to be up here speaking. Next thing you know, David's going to be delivering a communion meditation. God will be in control, not you. Your fears won't matter. And all that happens if you're not fully immersed in the water, but you're up at your ankles, is you give a larger target area for t Satan to attack. And then neat, neat little uh, round up there. I like that one. The question is, do you want to remain in control or do you want God to lead? Do you want to live in fear? That's the first key. Pray, seek, pray fast. Trust in the Lord, trust in the Lord. And you go from there. And that's all I have. So let's close in a prayer and then I'll turn this over to Quentin. Lord, we thank you for another day. I thank you again for this body of believers, this chance to worship together and sing your praises. Heavenly Father, with all the fear that's going on in this world right now, we can literally, honestly, each and every one of us say that there's no way we can fix it. So we turn it over to you as a congregation, Lord. I pray that you would heal this land, that we would come together, have a revival, and as a nation, we would seek you so that you would take care of us and again heal the land. Thank you, Lord. We thank you. Be with Sam and Mary Kay, Dick and Karen, and all those who are traveling. In Christ's holy and precious name I pray. Amen. I want to just give an invitation, and it's, you know, it's a really simple one because this concept of control, it works for both aspects. If you haven't made Jesus Lord of your life and you're ready to let him be in control, let him bless you, let him lead you and protect you and take care of you, there is no better time than right now to make that decision. <clears throat> Give him control. We, we're even having a cookie hour today. So everybody be around, we would love to fill the baptismal up. And, and be a part of watching you give that control over to the Lord and letting him be Lord and Savior of your life. But also, if you have made Jesus Lord of your life and you have found that, that you haven't given all that control or you've been slightly coming back out of the water, becoming a target, letting fear overcome you, then I encourage you to submit and jump all in. So that God can lead you where he wants you to be. See, that's a heart issue thing. And you don't got to come forward to do that. That's something you can do as you're standing as we sing this song that's coming up.
So I encourage you on both aspects. Let God be in control. Choose Jesus. So we please stand as we sing this song. Did I say that right? Um, has passed away, and just for that, that is Mary Morehouse's ex husband's brother. Did I get that right? Just so you understand, please be praying for the McConnell um, family and all the friends and, and those who are affected by his passing. And also, um, Jan is asking her friend Jeanette has had a stroke last Sunday. She's still in the hospital and hasn't woken up yet. So just as we saw that God does answer prayers, church, it's time for us to start praying again. And let's pray that the Lord will be working in Jeanette's situation and that he would help bring her, um, help wake her up and, and be with the family and that entire situation. Was there anything else that I may have missed um, if somebody didn't give me a prayer request or anything? Yeah. So your friend Izzy's sister, and what was her name? Audrey. And her boyfriend, they were going to a concert. They got in a um, car crash. Um, the boyfriend died on impact. And then um, Audrey, did I say that right? Um, she's got some massive issues going on. So prayers for Audrey and also her boyfriend. Do you know the boyfriend's name? Okay, we don't know the boyfriend's name, but pray for the family and all those who are going to be affected by this, we don't need to know the name because God knows. So be praying for them. And I, I will um, ask you to continue to pray for Sam and Mary Kay. And I do got a little bit of an update. Sam texted me the other day just to kind of give you guys, um, this is a, I'm asking you to pray for their, their drive and their safety, but also this is a praise. Um, let me see if I can pull it up. Um, he, he sent me this picture. I, you can't really see it, but Sam's sitting in front of this really beautiful building. And just sitting there, and I, he, he just sent this to me. And I, I texted him back and said, that's a beautiful building. Where are you, and how's the trip going so far? Because <laughs> it's like, he just send me, sends me this random picture. I'm like, I don't even know where you're at. But um, he, he wrote back and said, he's at the Bellamy Museum in Willington, North Carolina. And then he said, everything is going really good. They were in Daytona Beach the night he had um, texted me, and he said, both the water and the temperature are 80 degrees. <laughs> so it sounds like they're having a lot of fun, and I know Sam likes actually being warmer and in some of those weathers like that, so it, it sounds like their trip's going really well. Please continue to pray for them, um, that they get where they're going safely and come home safely. Um, yes? She had emergency surgery, and she did fine. She had a abdominal surgery, so she came out of the surgery, and she still needs prayers. But that's a huge praise, and we found out her name is Mary. <laughs> <laughs> that is a praise. Praise the Lord. Anything else? No. Okay. How about you stand with me, and we're going to open with a word of prayer, and then we'll sing the final song. Dear Heavenly Father. We come before you, Lord. We, we thank you for the praises that we have just heard. Um, 
Lord, it is always a, a blessing for us as the church to, to really be able to look and see your hand um, moving. We know that you are always moving. You are always answering prayers, not always in the ways we, we think they should be done. But Lord, we know you are good and you, you are taking care of the situation and we have nothing to fear. Father, I, I do pray for um, Jim McConnell's family. Um, he has passed and I pray that you would bring peace and comfort to them. Um, I also pray for Jeanette, who has had a stroke this last Sunday and um, is still in the hospital, Father, and she hasn't woken up. And, and I pray, Lord, that not only will you be with the doctors and the nurses, that they would be tools in your mighty hand, but, Lord, that you would wake her up. Father, we truly know you have the power as the great physician, and so that's what we are asking, Lord. Please, could you wake her up? and help the um, doctors to know exactly what they need to do. I also pray for um, Aubrey, who is struggling with um, massive health and health issues because of the accident she was in. Lord, will your healing hands be wrapped around her, and Lord, will you, will you um, be with the doctors and the nurses as well? Father, and we pray for her boyfriend's family. Um, he has passed away at the impact of the car accident. That is never easy. That is never easy when um, youth passes. So I pray, Lord, that you would bring peace and comfort to his family. And Lord, I pray that you would bring the right people to, to be around his family and Aubrey's family. And that, that, Lord, your glory, your comfort and peace would shine upon them and draw them closer to you. Father, we thank you so much. We love you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's sing this song. I will serve thee because I love thee. You have given life to Concludes our service. Cookies and coffee. Oh, oh, trivia. Oh, I just wanted to share this with you. I want to make everybody aware, if you aren't aware, that everybody has a God box. Did you know that? We all have a God box, and we think that He operates within the parameters of our God box. So I want to encourage you, as we go forward in this time of trial and trouble, to ask Him to take the lid off your God box and let you see how much bigger he is than you realize. And so um, I want to encourage you to, to read Psalm 91 every morning and claim that for yourself. And Psalm 91.4 says, He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. And I want to show you this picture that I took on the way back from... Um, vacation Bible school. Um, he, he took the lid off my God box, and so I look for him to talk to me in ways that I never did before. And if you look closely, you can see a wing there, and on the lower half down, a wing and the pinions of the, of the feathers. Can you see that? Can you see that? They just you, you can, and then up above there, there's a little bat-like creature on the left-hand side, up above. And he is covering us with his wings right now. And he's given us his protection. I just ask the Lord to open your eyes so you can see that. And I ask him to open your eyes so you can see the way he's talking to you in your life this week. Thank you.
Okay, that concludes our service. <laughs> <laughs> Coffee and cookies downstairs. Sorry, I didn't know you had something. I know, sorry. At the end.